Hello and welcome to today's online talk from West Berkshire Libraries on the act of nature watching. My name is Jacqueline Cooper and I'm very pleased to introduce you to our speaker today, who is Nicola Chester. Nicola, hello and welcome to you too. Hello, thank you Jackie, it's a real pleasure to be here. It's lovely to see you. Now many of our viewers who live locally will know of Nicola from her writing and if you're a member of Newbury Library, you may even recognise her because Nicola worked with us for some years before becoming the librarian at John Gaunt School in Hungerford. But she has a second career also, and many people will have read Nicola's long-standing nature column in our local newspaper, the Newbury Weekly News. Nicola is also a country diarist for national paper, The Guardian, as well as writing regularly for other publications, such as the BBC Country File magazine. She's the author of a book in the RSPB Spotlight series on otters, and I know that she has another title in preparation for publication later this year. Nicola, thank you for finding the time in your busy schedule to talk to us about nature watching. This is a topic that we know has become more important than ever to many people over this past year, and we're looking forward to hearing what benefits it can bring. Please tell us, why should we all be nature watchers? And how can we do it better? Thank you, Jackie. Thank you for such a warm welcome. Um, I'm just going to get my slides going. OK, um, yeah, I want to start by considering the extraordinary year that we've just had um, and are still emerging from and how our attitude to noticing nature might have changed and why that's a good thing to have come out of the pandemic. I'll do a few readings and I'll also talk a bit about what to look for at this glorious time of year. I recently reviewed a book for the Financial Times called Birdsong in a Time of Silence by Stephen Lovett. This is one of several that were written and published quite quickly about our response to the natural world around us as we went into national lockdown for the first time. After successive weekends of disruptive February storms, and the most glorious spring in living memory coincided with a virus that would stop the whole human world in its tracks. As Stephen Lovett puts it in his book, Birdsong in a Time of Silence, the crust of the planet ceased to judder with the noise dinning since the Industrial Revolution. Seismologists were able to track a wave of silence that passed over the earth. It was the sort of silence, according to this lyrical little book, on which the attention can feed and rediscover things that it thought it didn't know. That spring came like a second chance, a rhapsodic breathing space among the confinement, sadness and fear. There was blossom and birdsong like never before. If it sounded dystopian or apocalyptic, it was. And it still is, of course. But as Stephen Love it puts it exactly, it felt less like a catastrophe than an aftermath, as if nine-tenths of the population had disappeared overnight. For the first time ever, we were collectively given a chance to stop our headlong heedlessness, haste and waste, and consider what it all meant. The author of this book makes a lovely and poignant comparison with Edward Thomas's poem, Adelstrop, which I'll read now. Yes, I remember Adelstrop. The name because one afternoon of heat the express train drew up there unwantedly. It was late June. The steam hissed. Someone cleared his throat. No one left and no one came on the bare platform. What I saw was Adelstrop, only the name, and willows, willow herb and grass and meadow sweet and haycocks dry, no whit less still and lonely fair than the high cloudlets in the sky. For that minute, a black stone, close by and round him, mistier, farther and farther, all the birds of Oxfordshire and Gloucestershire. Stephen Lovett talks of our lives as being shunted onto one of time's branch lines, where it seems like Edward Thomas's Adelstrop, there is only birdsong. Thank goodness for that. The author acknowledges how our millennia old exposure to birdsong has influenced us. We've grown up with it, both individually and as a species. It is, he says, something we recognise as home. Birdsong's subtle power to ameliorate the anxiety and trauma of the pandemic takes us back to the comfort and carefree days of our youth when we notice such things. 
but arguably the biggest collective tragedy of the remarkable spring of 2020 would be if this were a swan song. That a pandemic that grew out of our indifference to and disregard for nature presages an apocalypse to come. That the association, joy and comfort of bird song and its own web of connection is gone forever. In Britain alone, we have lost 50 million songbirds since Rachel Carson wrote Silent Spring in 1962. We can only hope that spring, that spring, was not a last noticing before the bird song itself fades into silence. And that is why I've called this talk the act of nature watching. To use a quote from my own book, coming out this autumn, it is impossible to write with integrity about nature without protesting and resisting and waving a desperate red flag, isn't it? And that goes for nature watching too. I know I just don't want to be writing nostalgic elegies or laments for a lost, loved world. I want to celebrate its presence. I want to do a reading now from an anthology I was invited to contribute to in 2019, which seems a whole lifetime away. It's called Kidding Around, um, and it's edited by James Lowen and Hilary Brad from the Brad Travel Guides. And it's actually, ironically for us, a book on tales of travelling with children, ironically for reasons that you'll come to see. But I think this extract resonates more now when we've been so curtailed, when we've spent a year rediscovering or discovering anew what is on our doorstep. OK, here we go. Travel from the doorstep. There is not a passport between us in our family of five. Our three children, the eldest is 17, have yet to board a plane and fly anywhere. Yet last night, we saw four of the five species of owl resident in the UK, all within a mile of home. We travel. Mostly, it has to be said, circling away from the doorstep in repeated arcs of a few miles or so, hair-like, herring about, as many families do. But we know our wild neighbours intimately, and getting to know them is our first mission whenever we arrive anywhere. Travel for us has always been on a tight budget. We often camp, and when we are there, we explore our new temporary home from the doorstep, or awning, on foot, as freely and cheaply as possible. Once we camped in two small tents to give the children a greater sense of independence, and that's a little piece. Only we left one of the tents at home. The sight of all five of us and our collie dog leaving the two-man tent in quick succession the following morning caused a great deal of hilarity for our fellow campers among the Cumbrian hills. Another time we camped on a Welsh, hill Welsh hilltop after a heat wave broke with a vengeance. Within hours our tent blew down, the, the wind-up lantern hanging from the apex swinging wildly as a ship's bell before hitting me in the face at midnight. Yet huddled in the car as the wind rocked us back to sleep, the storm blew through, leaving a washed clean starfield sky, and we watched the first Perseid meteors fall through the sweep of the lighthouse beam from St Anne's. My elder daughter has, has developed the habit of wild swimming to really immerse herself in a new place, whatever the season. My son likes to get the new mud of a place ingrained as soon as possible, disappearing off with a map and mountain bike. Together, we greet after dark bin raiding badgers and barbecue licking foxes. It's my youngest daughter's speciality. We make a point of pointing these things out to others who might not have noticed or celebrate them with locals, striking up conversations with strangers. These are our real passports to place. Through the wild things that live where we merely visit, we have noticed to learn more. We, sorry, we have learned to notice more and on a deeper level. We travelled to Scotland on the proceeds of a book I wrote about otters, clutching an ambitious list of animals we'd like to see. The Glenorchy mountain range filled the windows of the white croft cottage that was to be our home for the next week. With a rucksack each, compass and map, we walked from the doorstep to the summit of Benasroin, the mountain behind the house. We left in warm sunshine, but book ended a week of mizzle. It's a wonder we could move at all. Everywhere the family looked, we saw something new. A small, dark, velvety flight of Scotch Argus butterflies, a path imprinted by the feet of high-altitude water voles. There were red, red squirrel, wildcat, pine martin and gold needle in these forests, and we were thrilled to think of it. 
thrill to think we might see them. We cleared the tree line with a sense of achievement. Rosie, just seven, was indefatigable in the lead. Below us, a Corrie Lake sparkled brilliance and the wide river Orkey snaked around its own hairpin bends with the blackness of a racetrack. On the open mountain, the path expired, but the children struck out confidently on a compass bearing to the summit, like the good scouts they all are. We stopped for lunch just as the expected weather closed in. We pulled on waterproofs and watched as the moor flared into radiance and small rainbows appeared around and below us. And then the sun disappeared for the week. As it began to rain, the view changed and changed again, disappearing, then reappearing. Walls emerged out of nowhere and granite boulders became sheep, became boulders. Thinking I'd spotted the triangulation point, I lifted my binoculars. But with something of a shock, what I focused on leapt up on broad, wide wings and vanished into the cloud. Was it? What was that? I cried. Nobody else saw it. Its sheer size meant it could only have been a golden eagle, if indeed it was there at all. With the summit reached, my husband altered tack, and so we began our descent straight down the mountain. Until this point, I'd been content and lazy enough to follow, marvelling at how well the children could navigate and orient themselves. Now, a little nagging voice came back to me from when I had first properly travelled with my own passport aged 18. I'd gone native, living with cowboys and cowgirls on a ranch in Canada's Rocky Mountains. Occasionally, we'd meet members of the Tutsina Indian First Nation community. An elder, intrigued by my English accent, offered me two pieces of advice. The first, that Yarrow Root was good for colds. He blessed me when I sneezed. And the second, given gravely and with pause, was this. Remember, you cannot just walk off a mountain. I had puzzled over its wisdom and meaning, but never thought to consider it literally until now, some 26 years later. My wisdom, probably because I had not engaged with map or compass to get us here. Apologies, there's a helicopter going over. Shaking the windows of my writing hut. <laughs> my wisdom, probably because I hadn't engaged with map or compass to get us here, was not listened to now. Purple moor grass, sedges and moss gave way to low heathery mats and dense tangles of bilberry and crowberry. Negotiating such complicated terrain for so long was exhausting. We bickered about whose fault it was to abandon the map and compass, about how much difficulty we were really in, or not. Visibility had become poor and it was now raining hard, but we chivied and goaded and cheered each other on. The going became increasingly steep and difficult and we were thwarted again and again by scree or sheer drops. The mountain began to gather the rainwater to its burns and throw it off outcrops as if they were gargoyles on a slate church roof. Glimpsed through cloud on the opposite hillside, they looked like static white forks of lightning. As the waterways deepened, so did the chasms we crossed, and the bracken thickened treacherously. Our slips became more frequent and more alarming. Yet when we reached out and grasped handfuls of myrtle, it held, releasing its wonderful scent. And when we did fall, and Rosie rolled, the purple heather was soft, yielding, and according to Rosie, bounced as the mattress. And thus ripe, staged, unlike falls, accompanied by contagious streaks of laughter. To the children, this was now a proper adventure, that they were stoically trying not to tire off, making up marching songs about being lost on a mountain, and what they were looking forward to when they, when they had to go back, or when they got back. But my husband and I, fairly experienced walkers, were beginning to feel a little irresponsible and foolish. We stopped, reconsidered, drank the last of the hot chocolate and ultimately scrambled back up on all fours to reach a point where we could angle our descent less steeply. We finally reached the soft hush of Pinewood and the road with relief and a humble sense of achievement, not long before dark. On our last evening, when the sun returned, we cooked tea in the, in the shingle crescent of an oxbow in the cola-coloured river. Wet otter prints were drying on the stones. We gazed up at Ben Lestroy, the offended mountain, and hoped that it wasn't. A very large bird came over the summit. Heart thumping wildly, I yelped and grabbed my binoculars. What's that? Surely that's 
even at 3,000 feet up and still struggling with a sense of proportion. There was no doubt, here were the flying barn door proportions of a golden eagle's two metre wingspan. Then something extraordinary happened. We were about to get a, a last lesson in scale. What appeared to be rabbits suddenly poured over the ridge. With astonishment, I realised that they were red deer, Britain's largest land mammal, and the eagle was driving them before it. Nothing could have prepared for us for what happened next. With two pairs of binoculars between the five of us, we watched hinds and calves bound down the mountain, the eagle in leisurely airborne pursuit. The raptor separated the herd and singled out a fleeing calf, sandwiched between two hinds and swooped on it repeatedly. We swapped and re-swapped the binoculars, hopping up and down when we didn't have them, reporting live when we did. What's it doing now? I asked. It's chasing them off the mountain, came the reply. Wait, no, the deer are standing up to it. With the calf losing pace, the herd stopped to face the bird, which hovered momentarily just above the leading deer. I have never seen a deer look skyward before. But on the ridge line, the two hinds did just that, looking up at the great dangling feathered shanks of the bird. One reared and struck out. The eagle dot dropped onto the calf, hitting it onto the withers. The youngster jinked away and the three scurried into the safety of the trees. The eagle, defied yet defiant, drifted back along the ridge without a single wing beat, vanished near the trig point. The mountain had offered us a second, intense, memorable experience. Eagles have been known to try and cause injury to large prey beyond their capabilities in the hope of picking it up later. It is rarely witnessed. We were lucky, but we'd also had all our senses open. We were better acquainted, the mountain and us, and as a family too. Our shared adventure had involved discovery, peril, wonder, argument, support, hilarity and absolute awe. The wild landscape and its inhabitants had allowed us a deeper understanding, a richer experience. Our eldest is on the cusp of independent travel. We're planning to buy him a passport for his 18th birthday, the age I was when receiving the Tsutsina's elder's wisdom. But he already has his own real passport to anywhere, a reason to travel, to meet new neighbours from the doorstep, with gentle inquiry and a willingness to be surprised. Eyes and all other senses wide open for the best experience ever. He will travel knowing its full worth, gift and boundless opportunity, for the joy of discovery and learning in his heart. With nature as his and his sister's passport, their lives will be all the richer. It makes the difference between being a tourist and an explorer anywhere. So that was one of our adventures. My son is now 19 um, and will be 20 this year. And as it happens, didn't get to travel. You'll not be surprised to hear. Um, he didn't get to explore a gap year. Though of course there is still time. But having three teenagers and knowing so many others, friends, children, and working in a secondary school library, I do feel that in many ways, the pandemic has hit these young people the hardest, from canceled proms and GCSEs and A-levels. My eldest daughter is 16 and has not yet been to a party, to gigs and festivals and events, gap years and first time independent travel, proper university. There's quite a short window of opportunity for these things in our lives. And I really hope that they get to do these rite of passage things. But I digress a little here, I know, but I think it's also worth saying that young people are amazingly resilient too. That a lot of good things will come out of this, not least a resilience to accept and deal with disappointment, to change plans and adapt, and to find their own amusement and ways to connect and challenge, um, challenge the way that we've been doing things to problem solve. And I think to think creatively and kindly. There's a huge resurgence in interest for young people in nature and what we're doing to the planet. So I think we look, need to look kindly upon any young people we come across and um, listen and look out for them. Um, I'm just gonna have a sip of water and then I'm going to read you another piece. Um, this is a piece that I wrote um, this time last year for The Guardian, um, my country diary, my, my slot. Um, so this was probably about 
two or three weeks into the into the pandemic. Um, okay. At the secondary school where I normally work as a librarian, I take key workers and other children on a nature niche. We undull our senses. Outside the closed off science block, we make deer's ears, cupping our hands behind our ears and directing them at the noisy rookery nursery. There are gasps at the enhanced volume. We wander to the edges of the playing field bordering Parland and hear a skylark singing at the height of the 100 metre sprint track where it placed upright. We find monk jack slots, a badger boundary latrine and learn the phrase ecological niche when a kite tussles midair with a buzzard. There is a brief talon grappling fall through the air before the birds are back in their own territorial airspace. I'd wanted to show them slow worms. I know where they are, but we run out of time. I'm assailed by a memory, walking my middle child to her last day at primary school. A slow worm crossed our path and she picked it up. It wrapped its strong, burnished copper body around her thin wrist like a protective amulet. We admired its faint Mona Lisa smile and watched it blink and found its ears, hence with brackets around its head, things that mark it out as a lizard and not a snake. Revising Macbeth for a GCSE that she will never sit, my daughter and I realised that the witch's ingredient of a blind worm's sting was the shed end of a slow worm's or totemized tail. It prompted the same memory in her of her last day at primary school and produced fresh tears at the denial of her secondary one. The students and I exchange pledges to stay safe and on the way home, there is a slow worm on the road. A school ruler's length of rope that I might have missed if I hadn't half expected to see one. I stop on the dusty, deserted road and pick it up. It coils its cool, tubular body around my wrist, just as it did my daughter's all those years ago. With a greyer, polished, blue-flecked body, it is a male. I wait for it to blink and release it like a slipped bracelet among the violets on the bank. That was my piece for the Guardian this time last year. The UK is one of the most nature depleted countries in the world, and that shocks me. We're a country that can simultaneously adopt the hedgehog as our most favorite wild animal, whilst letting it through our own actions head on its way to extinction. In my lifetime alone, we have lost 60% of the world's fauna and continue to lose it at an increasing rate. We have never been so distanced and alienated from nature. And there is a cost to that, physically, mentally, culturally, and emotionally. But here's the thing. Here's the good that has come out of the pandemic in such a timely way. People are noticing and cherishing and talking and reading about nature in a significant way. And ultimately, that translates into political, social and environmental action. What it translates into is hope. Why should we watch nature? I think the short answer is that we're hardwired to. It turns out it is in our interest to be. It is in our interest to be interested in and to enjoy nature. It is a love that provides consolation even as it is lost. And therefore, along our road to planetary ruin, we can find a way back to some kind of human evolution that includes the earth we stand on, the air we breathe, and all the living interconnected things that we manage to simultaneously hold in awe and ignore. It's an evolution of love and wonder, if you like. I'd like to... Um, talk to you a little bit now about um, an author, a friend of mine called Lucy Jones. Um, her book, Losing Eden, Why Our Minds Need the World, is a, is a brilliant read. It's a, it's a must read. Um, and um, I was lucky enough to interview Lucy when her book was launched, I think the week before lockdown um, last year. <laughs> um, she's had quite a year. The author Lucy Jones talks about this in her excellent book, Losing Eden, Why Our Minds Need the Wild, published just last year. It is full of astonishing, mind-blowing facts around why we cannot lose the wonderful biodiversity we share this one planet with. From the physical benefits of contact with soil bacteria, 
reducing inflammation and having a positive impact on mental health as an antidepressant as well, to the Japanese tradition of forest bathing or Shinrin Yuku, which is simply and mindfully being around trees or walk through a wood with all your senses engaged. It has been proven by Japanese studies to lower stress levels, raising feelings of positivity and well-being, decreasing anxiety, depression and fatigue, and increasing energy. Studies showed that trees emit chemical phytoncides, thought to boost the immune system with anti-cancer proteins. The physical benefits of a two-hour walk through trees was shown to last a full month afterwards. This makes it increasingly urgent to stop for us to stop felling trees unnecessarily. But the act of nature watching is also an act of beauty, wonder and awe, where we can connect with our inner child. And that can actually make us healthier and extend our lives. This is where things get lighter. Lucy also talks of a study by Professor Jennifer Stella at the University of Toronto that found that experiencing awe, wonder and beauty promote healthy levels of cytokine proteins that suggested the things that we do to experience these emotions, a walk in nature, losing oneself in music or looking at art, have a directly positive influence on health and life expectancy, but also on how we behave and treat each other. People are more likely to share winnings from a lottery with strangers after experiencing awe and wonder. And that could simply be watching a sunset or a skylark rise, singing up until it is out of sight. Try doing that, not smiling. Over and over again, people have been shown to be more ethical, kind and generous after feeling awe. It binds us together socially, improving our odds for survival. And I'm just going to read um, my favourite bit of Lucy's book. There is an abundance of wonder in our home that we are losing as habitats shrink and our connection wanes. Antlers, orcas, sea stars, stag beetles, curlews, rotifers, toadstools, glowworms, puffins, bats, chrysalids, shooting stars, red velvet mites, the rosy maple moth, Christmas tree worms, the bioluminescent strawberry squid, pygmy shrews, wolves, crows, nudibranchs, owls. Really, awe is Earth's signature. We may have forgotten, but how could it not be? The adorable, terrible, leaky, stinky, gooey, glimmery, furry, bloody, swoony, shimmery, thumping majesty of the Earth. The very earthiness of it. It claws, it kicks, it rots, it ruts, it squawks, it squeals, it chomps, it bursts. What a wild and mind-bending disco there is on the earth, if we would only look and take notice. I love that. I love that. Well done, Lucy. <laughs> um, but I think it's, it's well worth saying that um, access to nature isn't available to all. And this is nothing short of a tragedy. Fewer than one in ten, ten, sorry, fewer than one in 10 children regularly play in natural spaces now. One in 10. And the area around a child's home where they play unsupervised has shrunk by 90% since I was born in the 1970s. A sophisticated three year study by the RSPB in 2013 concluded that four out of five children do not have adequate connection to the natural world. And this isn't necessarily the countryside. It could be a park with wild areas, a city allotment. There are lots of inhibitors and reasons at play here, but access is the biggest. It needs to be made a fundamental right. And the good news is people are beginning to shout about that. And I think that that has accelerated this year. Um, I'm going to read another piece that I wrote um, the New Weekly News a couple of years ago. Um, and it's about our big hill, mostly anyway. Um, and again, it was written at, um, at this time of year. Through an open gateway, the wide expanse of Hippenscombe Valley, which is what you can see in the picture, 
is full of flowering oilseed rape that glows against my skin, a buttercup under the chin. Yellow hammers spill, spill out onto the road, their light bulb heads bright as the flowers, and among them, almost missed, a thrilling glimpse of a yellow wagtail. A fast declining farmland bird, box fresh from Africa in sunshine yellow. It calls three times, runs into the buttery crop and vanishes. Washing white clouds, gallant like galleons, sail over the hill in an endless flotilla of tall ships. In the small wood below the big hill, a cuckoo calls. Its voice catches in the thorns at intervals. Chased by cloud shadows, I realise it is still travelling. A storm comes through and turns the barley field into a heaving blue-green ocean. The wind curves and cones it into swirls and eddies and races it up the slope towards the dog and I in waves of silver surf to crash into the hedge. It is mesmerising. I try to film it but struggle to hold the phone steady. It ripples like the pelt of a moving animal and is infectious. The dog and I run too, her ears flying, my arms windmilling. Blossom strews the lane and salts the nettles. Flowers of the oak and miniature posies of hawthorn flowers lie like the aftermath of a wedding. There is a sad, dead lamb. But also a new foal, rain-freshened birdsong, mud to build nests with, and the heady scent of lilac enhanced by thundercrack. Back beneath the hill, the fast-changing cloudscape alters the light again and again, as if I am being shown a speeded-up time-lapse lapse panorama. It illuminates the linen folds and creases I know so well, only to hide them and reveal others in quick succession. I can't take my eyes off it. There is a yellow-green haze on the hill that I haven't seen in ten years. I must go and investigate. At the bottom of the hill, where it seems that sheep go to die, there are vertebrae and a sprung rib cage, chalk bones springing cowslips. On the grassy pillow tump of an anthill, a sheep skull rests as if it has just breathed its last herb scented breath. Grazing sheep are essential to this flower rich landscape, though in past years they have been left on the dam too long. The flowers grazed off and the insects and birds declined. This year, though, the grazing rotation is in place. In the evening light, the hill emanates gold, a heap of, a heap of piles, treasure and nectar, the impression of millions of tiny trembling yellow bells visible from the A4. And I'm hoping that in the next few weeks or so, um, we'll see this happen again. I'm not sure it's quite such a good year for cowslips, but um, I've already seen the leaves up there, so um, it's well worth a trip up. So, um, there's another view there actually of, um, of the cowslips on the hill. And you can see, I think in, in um, real contrast, that the wildness of the hill, it's actually um, a triple SI, so protected as a site of special scientific interest. And you can see the farm fields below it that look as if they've been groomed into shape. Um, and that perfect circle of a wood below as well. That's called the ball wood for obvious reason. Um, I think I might mention now actually um, what to look for now. Uh, April, I think, end of April, spring really, is just such an exciting time for um, noticing wildlife and nature wherever you are. And I think um, the, the most wonderful thing about this is, is birdsong, which you can hear wherever you are, wherever you find yourself. Uh, and our summer migrant birds are flooding in now. The swallows are here. I haven't heard a cuckoo yet, but I'm holding my breath. Um, and I've heard willow warbler and black cap and chiff chaffs, which are really easy to identify because they literally say their name over and over again. Like chiff chaff, chiff chaff, which is wonderful. Um, I think it's a really lovely idea to welcome them by learning their names, learning who they are and, and matching them to their song. Um, it's not always easy to do. And you may well, you may be experts in this, I don't, I don't know, but um, learning bird song is, is just, the most joyful thing and the best way to do it I think is is to try and pick out um, a song 
Um, and, and it's a little bit like, I suppose, trying to pick out an instrument in a band. Um, you have to really tune in and really concentrate those senses. But if you can, if you can pick out a particular song and listen to it over and over, and then follow that sound to the bird, see if you can find it, and take the time and watch it. Binoculars are great, but they are not essential. Um, if you can find that bird and know what it's doing, and crucially, I think, where it is, what habitat it is in, um, then you can go back and check in books or online. Um, the RSPB website is brilliant for that because you can um, type in what you guess the bird might be and then play its song. And one thing you absolutely must do, if you've never done it before, is listen to the dawn chorus in your pyjamas. Um, it's just the most incredible thing. And again, I think wherever you are, there will be bird song of some sort. And you can go out, you don't, you, you can just, you'll have to set your clock early, your alarm early, but um, make a cup of tea, get out there, put your dressing gown on, or just open the window and it is absolutely life affirming. It's wonderful. Another thing I think is a really nice thing to do this time of year is see if you can find a skylark and then watch it rise singing and it will sing up and up. It will go vertically um, hundreds of feet into the air until it actually disappears and it rains its song down um, even when it's going up and then again when it's coming down and it will shut that song off just a few feet above the ground and then it parachutes down and then it will run to its nest so it's not alerting predators to exactly where its nest is. Um, you, can, you can find them on open downland, but also playing fields and, and some more urban places as well. It's, it's, um, they're not an impossible bird to find, but it is impossible not to smile, I think, when you're looking up at them singing upwards like that. And of course, it's a wonderful time for spring flowers. The bluebells, um, places, we, we have some wonderful local nature reserves and um, Bowdown Woods is wonderful this time of year for spring flowers. And really take your eye in as well because the bluebells are, are, the, are the grand show or, or a stretch of wild garlic is wonderful. But don't neglect the little tiny flowers either. Um, like wood soil, it's, it's just exquisite. Or the tiny little town hall clock faces of moss chattel. Um, and if you're not embarrassed about it, and why should you be, take along a magnifying glass and it really brings their little world a, a alive. Another thing you can do at this time of year, it, it, I mean, you can, you can always do it any time of year, but it's just best in spring, um, is watch badgers. It's not as difficult as you might think. And there are more badgers around closer to you than you might think as well. But the first thing to do is find a set. Um, you'll, you'll need to look for spoil heaps. Um, literally, it will look as if a small digger has been in and made a hole and the spoil heap it forms a ramp to their home. And then you'll find worn tracks and horseshoe shaped entrances. And there are usually quite a few together. Um, and of course, the badger latrines, they're very neat animals and they will make a little little boundary toilets around their area um, and use those. So if you spot those, you know you're, you're onto, onto badger territory. So um, once you've found your set, go back at sunset, um, wearing dark, unrustly colours, trying not to smell strongly of anything, um, which is quite difficult actually, because you're going out in the evening, so you've probably just cooked tea. Um, but if you can, <laughs> try to go out, um, just, just before sunset and make sure you approach the set downwind so the wind is in your face and then wait up against a tree uh, or at least something that will blur your silhouette. Um, badgers haven't actually got very good eyesight but they've got incredibly good um, hearing and sense of smell. So bear that in mind that you may well get lucky um, and see the cubs emerge and, and see them play. Um, now, I think I need to sort my slides out here, but another thing to do, again, I, I mentioned that we have some fantastic nature reserves locally. Um, local visits after dark to hear some very special birds cannot be missed. 
if you've never done it, try and do it this spring. We've got some wonderful heathland here um, from Snellsville Common to uh, Greenham Common. Um, and then you can go out to sort of Tadley or smaller commons such as Newtown mm. as well. Um, and they are wonderful places to hear uh, some very, very special night birds that, um, that come over here uh, for the summer. In particular, woodcock and nightjars and nightingales. And I'm going to read you a bit about uh, woodcocks in, in, in just a second. But um, these are all three incredible birds and are among my favourites. Uh, Crook and Common is a wonderful place to listen to nightingales. They will sing throughout the day and night, incredible birds. They, they will just sing for, I think, something ridiculous, like 23 hours <laughs> until they find a mate. Um, and the song, if you, it, when, once it's isolated by night, is just heartbreakingly beautiful. It really is a magical thing. Um, and if you don't know what they sound like, go back to that um, RSPB website and play the song or, or try an app um, and then go and find them and just listen. It's wonderful. And Woodcock and Nightjar, um, you can often see them patrolling their territories in the evening as well. And the, the Nightjar is, is the strangest of birds. It's, it looks like a giant swift, um, but it forms this sort of puppetry I think I would I would describe it as but they are very curious birds and will come and investigate you so again just go out at night in the evening um lovely warm summer evening I'm imagining um and uh, and see if you can spot them as well and woodcock now I'm going to talk to you I'm going to read a piece um about woodcock um, while I find it, the screen I'm showing you now is just a selection of the things that I've, um, I've written about over the years um, on Gallows Down. Gallows Down is there quite a bit, um, but also um, a poor fallen heron that I discovered as well. It's like, like an Icarus bird. And uh, in the centre of the picture, you can see an ant nest uh, that was raided by a badger. More photographs here. Of course, we're um, spring weather can always be a little bit iffy, <laughs> but um, up on our high hill here, where the um, these humpy bumpy bits are, we call them antle bumps. Um, they are meadow ant hill nests, and I just love them. I, I in the summer they are covered with the most beautiful chalk grass and herbs. So you get um, marjoram growing on them, wild thyme. Um, chalk milkwort and the beautifully named squinancy wort and they make these wonderful pillows that you can just um, lean against and just watch the skylarks they're wonderful but of course in the snow in the winter um, they look fantastic as well and the middle picture is of um, the gateway to our house in winter in uh, winter um, in case you think that I, I am in some idyllic location <laughs> which I am but uh, but it has its downsides <laughs> um, and the picture um, with the, the footprints you can see in the snow, um, that was on the hill up here on Walbury Hill. Um, and I was tracking a hare that day. It was wonderful to, to, um, to follow that. So I'm going to read my piece about the woodcock. Now, um, I was invited to contribute to a book last year um, by uh, a chap called Yolo Birder. Um, his real name is Kit Dewitt, but um, he's known as Yellow Birder. Um, and uh, he wanted to champion the cause of our most threatened birds, I suppose. Um, there are 67 of them, which is why the bird is called Red 67. The red part is that they're red listed, so that they are our most endangered bird birds. Um, and he invited um, artists to um, to illustrate the bird and, and then writers to write a piece. So it was a really beautiful collaborative effort. Um, it's a stunning book. It is available um, yeah, from all good bookshops and all great libraries as well. Um, and uh, it may surprise you to, to know 
that some of the birds included in this in this um, list are really what we what we would possibly think of as as common birds. You know, a, a song thrush um, is one that, that always shocks me. Um, and um, our little uh, marsh tits and willow tits. We uh, we do have a little. I think the last remaining population of willow tits in in West Berkshire up on the downs here. But skylark. I mean, skylarks are birds that we've mentioned in literature going back, goodness, to Chaucer and Shakespeare, and it's endangered. Anyway, starling as well, field fair. Um, I'm going to read the piece on the woodcock. The woodcock is inseparable from its environment. A prober of damp woodland, its cryptic camouflage blends bar bands and bars of foxed chestnuts mollusk browns and heartwood creams, marbled black and ash greys, rust, cola. Its Latin name is Scolopax rusticola. Woodcock shares the same crepuscular puppetry of nightjar. Its spring dusk roading flights are arresting, a slow beating the bounds along invisible roads at treetop height. In open air theatre clearings under a lamplight moon, it performs, silhouetted in the round, vocalising a froggy ought, 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 and a pig squeal. Occasionally, the flight paths of patrolling males overlap in the shallowest of Venn diagrams when the birds glance around each other. The nest is a feathered scrape on the ground. Hen woodcock are believed to carry their chicks from danger in their feet or press between legs and body. But the migration myth of gold crests piloting woodcock over the North Sea remains just that possibly. Woodcock flight seems workmanlike, with intent only to land. Disturbed, it appears as loose ground come adrift, its long bill pointed down, balancing needle or divining rod, angled so that even in flight it has not lost contact with the earth. Drayton, Shakespeare and Milton use the bird as a metaphor for foolish love, for its unwillingness to hop over objects. Simple, maze-like springs were set to catch a bird easily led down a garden path or copper road. Our resident population is boosted to 1.4 million individuals in winter, making journeys averaging 3,000 kilometres from frozen Europe where they can no longer access food. They are still shot as game. Feeding nightly, woodcock gather like groups of Victorian philosophers, wings clasped behind backs, isolated in thought. They probe the earth with an extraordinarily long bill, exploratory core drilling, taking the earth's temperature with the precision of a slow sewing machine needle, unthreading worms and snags of beetle from the fabric of the earth, sucking them up like spaghetti. On hands and knees, I've got about as close as it's possible to get to a woodcock. It sat like a wooden carving, an upturned boat of a body, a dumpy wood arc, a vessel of worms clinker built with lines of hourly feathers, its large intelligent eye set high on its rounded, banded, umbrella handle head, glinted like a tiny onyx. I saw the mobile bump at the end of its bill move. Water oozed through the stitch holes made by it moments before between my splayed fingers. So that's our woodcock. And to think that you can see that bird locally, I think, is amazing. Um, when I first moved to the house here, um, gosh, some 17 years ago now, um, though I'd only moved from up the road, we used to get woodcock in the spring roading over the house now, but um, we don't anymore. And I think they've probably, in the summer anyway, um, become locally extinct, um, although they do come over in the winter. So... The last question then really, I think, is um, can we do nature watching better? Of course we can, of course we can. I think protest and resisting the loss of something can mean many, many things and cumulative small acts make big waves of change. But I think the most important thing is to notice things, follow things up. Um, these little blue tits that I'm showing you um, are from this funny little um, post box nest hole that they seem to use every year um, 
And I only noticed it because I followed up this funny little cheeping sound and um, that's when I spotted them. Um, but I think it's important to, to, to remember that cumulative small acts can make these big waves of change. We don't all have to climb trees or, or dig underground to protest. There are plenty of practical things we can do. Gardening for wildlife, feeding the birds and cleaning the feeders regularly, making a whole low in a garden fence for hedgehogs to travel through. Don't use stub pellets or weed killers. Applaud the town council for planting wildflowers in the parks. But I think the most important thing is to make your interest and love of nature infectious. Show others, talk about it and celebrate it. Nature watching is an act of mindfulness. It's an act of peace. It's an act of solace and remembrance and beauty. It's an act of utter joy and discovery. It's nothing short of a love for life. So go on, spread the joy. Mm, thank you so much, Nicola, for sharing some beautiful photographs with us, for some wonderful readings and a truly inspiring talk. Will you be returning to these issues in your new book? Yes, I, I will. Um, but yeah, there are quite a few issues that I've, that I've covered. Um, my book, which um, will be called On Gallows Down, um, it, will, it should be out in the autumn, and it's, it's part nature writing, part memoir um, of the nature and landscape in my life and the fierce desire to protect it. Well, I'm sure we'll all look forward to reading it as soon as it is published and we wish you every success with it. This is such an important message. So thank you again and thank you to everyone who has been watching with us today.